The block is placed at the top edge of a frictionless half pipe. On the other side of the half pipe is an uncompressed, yet again, massless spring. The block has a mass of 20 kilograms and starts at a height of 3.7 meters. At rest, the bottom part of the spring is at a height of 2 meters. When released, the block will slide down the half pipe, compress the spring by x equals 0 0.5 meters. So it will wind up having compressed this by an additional 0 0.5 meters. And then it will be forced back because that's the maximum amount that it makes to. So if that's the maximum amount that it makes it, what do we know just before it starts being forced back? If you get to the very apex of your movement and then you have to fall back down, what do we know about that snapshot, that exact instant when you're at the very apex, your velocity is zero. We know at the moment when you are forced back, your velocity is zero. If we take a quick example that's not quite the same as this, we toss a ball into the air, right? At some point, that ball is going to fall back down to the earth. Now, if it's moving along, it's going to continue to have that x moving this way. But its y vector is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually it's zero at the instant it begins to fall back down. So at the very top, we know here is a zero. So at the apex, at the very switch over between moving in one direction and coming back the other direction, you have to have a zero velocity. So that's going to be a key point for us to understand in this problem. All right, so we know that our mass is equal to 20 kilograms. Or the height that it starts at is 3.7 meters. The height, that it, the height that the bottom of the spring is at is 2 meters. And the x that it gets compressed is 0 0.5 meters. And now we want to know what is the k involved. All right, so we know that energy at the start plus the work involved is equal to the energy at the end, right? So. What's the work involved? We're on a frictionless half pipe. It's a massless spring. Is there any air resistance? No, we can assume that there's no air resistance because it's not moving that fast and we were never mentioned. So we're going to make it a little easier on ourselves. We're going to remove all the cases of work. If this were a real problem, a real world, sorry, it is a real problem, but if this were something that was truly, really, really careful in a real world engineering situation, we'd have to start taking into account what kind of friction was involved, what kind of um, air is going to, how dense is the thing, you know, is this going to be taking place um, in an area that has a lot of air pressure, perhaps it's going to be taking place in a vacuum, but it will still have some amount of friction involved. These are things that we'd have to care about if we were engineering, but we got, we got a specific example problem that we have things where we know about it, we know that it's frictionless, we know that there's no air resistance, we know the spring's massless, so we don't have to worry about work going into anything else than just what our equations are here, so we can knock out work. So what's the energy that it starts with? Well, it starts off at a certain height, right? Is it moving at that height? Is there any energy stored in its motion? I mean, not stored. Is it moving? No, it starts at rest at the instant before it's let go and starts to move. So at the beginning, we just have potential energy of gravity. At the end, what is it? where is it at the end? What are the things going to be involved in the end? Well, we've compressed the spring, right? We compress the spring by an amount, so we've got 1 half kx squared. That's going to definitely matter. Anything else? Is it moving at that moment? No, it's not moving, so we don't have to worry about the energy in velocity. What's its height? Is its height anything? Yes, its height is something. We know it's up here, right? So in the total is going to wind up being 2.5 meters for its height up here. So plus mgh at the end. OK. So at this point, we're ready to do it. So we've got mg h start minus m g h end equals one half k x squared. We know what x is, we know what m is, we know what g is, we know what h at the start is, we know what h at the end is, we just plug and chug. All right, so two times m g h start minus m g h end equals K, and we're also going to, to, to divide by that x squared, x squared. We plug everything in, and we're going to get 2 times 20, uh, sorry, yeah, 2 times 20 
times 9.8 times, well, doesn't really matter in, in this case, but it'd be a little bit easier to figure out what's on the inside first. In fact, we can make it even, even a little bit easier by pulling out the mg, h start minus h end, right? over x squared is equal to 2 times what's m, 20, what's g, 9.8, times what's h at the start, 3.7, what's the height at the end, that's the amount that the bottom of the spring is, plus the 0.5 that it went up beyond that, right? Because it compressed the spring 0.5 past equilibrium. So it had to make it up to equilibrium, 2 meters, and then it had to go a little bit farther to 2.5 meters off the bottom. So minus 2.5. Close that up, divided by what's x, x is the 0 0.5, and it's squared. Punch that into a calculator, and our final answer is 1882 newton meters. Newtons, not newton meters, newtons per meter. Newton meter is work. Newtons per meter, 1882 newtons per meter is equal to RK. Now, I left everything in the variable form for a very long time, and that's because I think the easiest way to do a problem is to be able to get all of your thinking done with variables, because variables are easier to think about. They're easier to think about what does this mean in a general way. Once you start throwing in numbers, you just wind up getting this mass of numbers that often you can't separate what the ideas are here. But in this case, we're able to see that it's the difference between the starting potential energy minus the ending potential energy is going to be how much energy we have left over for our spring, right? And then 2x squared is what we've got for, um, for how much the spring's other components are to get just the, sweet, the, the k that we're trying to get to. to. Just to get to k, we have to multiply by 2 and divide by x squared. So I left it as that and then substitute it in. There's no reason you couldn't substitute things in as you went. If that's easier for you and you feel more comfortable with it, it certainly works. I'd recommend trying it this way every so often, though. I certainly think it's easier to keep all your variables together at the end and then do one long session of computations at the end. But sometimes that's going to wind up being uh, a, trouble, a trouble for you if you wind up having difficulty with the order of operations. Like if you accidentally didn't do this operation first, you'd be in hot water, right? So you have to pay attention to what makes it easier for you. But I think this is the best way to do it. In any case, we've gotten to our answer, 1,882 newtons per meter. All right, this is going to end the session on energy. Uh, this ends our, our set of lessons on energy. I hope you've learned a lot about energy. hope you've got a much better understanding. There's a whole lot more that you can do with it, um, but that's for future courses, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. All right, thanks.